it's a pleasure to be among you, and especially with this esteemed group of people who have so many ideas, so many good things that are going to be going on. Now, beware. I'm sure this widget works. We've had some trouble today. Beware of giving a preacher man a mic, because he might talk to you about love. <laughs> and I am indeed today coming to talk to you about love. But it's not about the divine love. It's not about the love between spouses or lovers. What I'm talking today about is about those kinds of love between human beings, of seeking the good of another, of helping those in need of compassion for one another. The classical definition of love, if it will come up, there it is. Love is seeking the good of the other, seeking the good of the other. Keep that in mind as we move throughout this. Because that means you can love anyone. You don't have to like them. You can love your enemy. You can seek their good, even if you don't like what they're doing or what they represent. Now, we're going to be looking at that in a number of different directions. And a lot of people today in their speeches have given us examples of seeking the good of another in so many wonderful ways. Everything from technology to, to social goods, all sorts of things that have come up. But first, before we go into that, with my little dog and pony show here, it's a question of how can we support the ways we seek the good of another? How can we create sustainable ability to seek the good of another in all kinds of ways, be it institutional or otherwise? But first, a little bit of ancient wisdom we're going to be coming up with that I want to show you proves love and money can go together. It's true. Now, my brothers, 1,500 years ago, started the monastic life in the West. Benedictine brothers in Italy, and then my own Cistercian brothers, which was a reform of that particular order, in 900 years ago in France, started our monks. Now, what is it we do, and why is that important for what I'm about to show you? Our life is based on two ideas, ora et labora pax, to pray and to work to bring about peace. Now, that is really what we're about and what we do. In our rule of life, and this is what's important for what follows, we are supposed to support ourselves. But in supporting ourselves, the work that we do is supposed to bring to us not only food on our table, but allow us to put food on others' tables, to provide creative expression on a human level for ourselves, and to help bring a certain balance in humanity into our own lives. So prayer and work bringing about peace not only to ourselves, but for others. So the question is, within this, what do we do to support ourselves? And how does that come about? Again, we're talking about a 1,500-year tradition of self-support in various ways. Now, over the centuries, we've done all kinds of things. We used what resources we had and what was needed at the moment to come up with ways to support ourselves. We have manuscript making. That one's not so easy to see, but that is a 16th century chocolatier factory in a monastery of my own order. Um, she may ale, which some may appreciate is the top beer in the world, most years going. Um, we also make all kinds of cheeses, both here in Canada and obviously in France and in other areas. And wine uh, in many places throughout the world. This is the Abbey of Laurence on the Isle of St. Honorat, just off of Cannes. My point in all this, we've done all kinds of things. We've raised sheep, controlled the sheep and wool trade of the British Isles for 400 years. We have re introduced or introduced at the first point, water wheels grinding and industrial grinding for the wheat and everything else into Europe, as well as modern forgeries and industrial forging throughout the continent at the time. We've had all kinds of technology and used all of this to support ourselves, and it was commerce. Now, contemporaneous with the foundation of my order, Hugh of St. Victor, a priest in Paris in the 12th century, said, the pursuit of commerce reconciles nations, calms wars, strengthens peace, and transforms the private good of individuals into the common benefit of all. Notice that last thing, transforms the private good of individuals into the common benefit of all. This is important, and it leads us on to where we're going to be going for the rest of the talk. So how does all of this affect us today? Why is a monk coming before you to talk about making money. That doesn't make sense. I have no income, personally. I am the worst paid CEO in the United States at this point. In fact, I have asked every year, and they have doubled my salary for the past eight years. Double zero. 
zero. So the question is, how do we support our lives and our good works for others? It's because we're seeking the good of others and doing it in unique ways of using for-profit means to make things come about. Now, let's look at charitable institutions, at least in the West. We have generally three different kinds of ways that charity works today. Let's take our little uh, carpenter fellow, a fellow who works. He works, he makes some money, and with what he can, he gives it to those that need it. It could be an institution, it could be his church, it could be directly. That's one way. Individuals who make money and give it to someone else. Secondly, you have institutions that are dedicated to serving the needs of the community in some way. They are nonprofit institutions. And how do they make their money? They beg. Please give me. Please give me. They beg in all kinds of ways. Begging by direct institutions. And then we have corporations. Name your corporation, whatever it may be, who give from their profit to organizations to support them. And this is good, and we encourage this, and a lot of income comes from that. At the same time, let's also notice that most corporations will also get a tax benefit for giving money. So in some way, they may not actually be taking from their profits, but just redirecting government funds in a different way. But we still need their support. Now, I think there's a fourth way. In fact, I know there is. It's been going on 1,500 years. But before I reveal the secret, I need to give you a little lesson in profit and nonprofit. Not-for-profit, we usually think of institutionally, usually equates with for good. Not-profit things, institutions, or work, usually means something that is doing good for others. Now, for-profit, what I would like to see is that for-profit institutions, which often don't have that kind of good connotation, but I think they can and should, so that we are going to transform for-profit into for-good. Now, let's think about this again. For-profit often means for my personal good. That I'm a business owner, I'm making money for me, or perhaps for my family, or a corporation, for my stockholders. But what if we could transform for-profit institutions into looking for the common good, like St. Hugh or Victor had to say before. Now, we move from that, I think we've reached a level in our society today where we haven't advanced enough social consciousness and a certain living of compassionate life that allows us to move to a different way within secular society, the one that in the monastic life we've been doing for a long time. That is, a for-profit business that's corporate goal is to support good works. It's not for the bottom line of profit for the stockholders, shareholders, or the personal owner, but it's a business that is started and run exclusively to support good works. It could be supporting an institution or to support various good works in different ways. Now, with this, you come to something that's very interesting, of a fiscal year showing ultimately no profit because it's all given away in supporting good works in one way or another. That's social entrepreneurism at its radical best. And that's something that's worth thinking about. Now, what we call this at home is commerce with compassion. And my thing got small. There it is. I don't know how that happened. It works on mine but commerce with compassion. And that's worth keeping in mind as we move on to the next stage. Ultimately, what does this create in society if you have for-profits that are supporting non-profits directly? You create a customer base that's purchasing with a purpose. They're purchasing from this particular group because they know that they support this. Ooh, what's that going to do down the line? What you create when you put these two together Commerce and compassion, purchasing with a purpose, is a synergy between the for-profit and the non-profit, between producers and consumers, that creates a society that together is seeking the good of the other. Wait, you mean a market economy and capitalist society that operates on love? Very interesting and worth thinking about. What we put together in the non-profit world with all of this is passion for the good, purpose in seeking that kind of good and helping out, we can produce sustainability for nonprofit institutions along the way. This is powerful stuff. Let's look at a few examples. Girl Scouts, most people know about. Nonprofit organization, they have a great program, the Girl Scout Cookies, and everybody's probably bought them and eaten them, and they're wonderful, and it's a great product and a great business. And it is exclusively for supporting the Girl Scouts. Wonderful example. My own company at home, lasermunks.com commerce with compassion where 
Initially, we started out selling toner and inkjet cartridges. It's expanded to other things. But the point was, we took an item that people needed. In fact, it came because my printer ran out of toner. I said, it's way too expensive. There's got to be a better way. And I said, let's offer this. So we're just middle monks offering a product. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the product is, but we're offering it, we're selling it, and it's supporting not only my small and very modestly living monastery, but all sorts of organizations around the world. This is a good way to do business and for society to think about things. Another example, Goodwill. Everyone knows about them. Wonderful business that supports all kinds of good things, among which are particularly training people and giving them work, putting them into the workforce. A wonderful example, a for-profit that serves a non-profit end exclusively. Now, I'll move on. This one's not going to be so clear. They're bumping into each other. The next line that my own monastery has moved into, and which we're really starting to transition to more so, is a new company we've got called Benevolent Brands. All sorts of benevolent things. I'll show you two or three. But what happens is we take a particular product and we attach it to a particular nonprofit good, if you will, apart from it supporting the Abbey as well. In this case, we have our coffee company, Benevolent Blends, which supports the families that pick our coffee beans in lots of third world countries. We also have, I hope, we also have our Benevolent Bakery, which supports a number of different things for the homeless and in helping others um, around the country. We have our Benevolent Biscuits, Doggy Biscuits, whose income supports those organizations that teach animals how to help human beings in need. Pretty cool. We also have benevolent baskets, monastic gift baskets that support other religious communities around the world by putting all their stuff in these cool baskets you can use for Christmas and Mother's Day and Easter. Another wonderful idea. Now, the possibilities for other nonprofits, there's all kinds out there. It doesn't matter what you do. You can pick a product or a service, by, you know, start a subway or, or whatever it is. Pick a company, do something, start something to help support your nonprofit interest. Now, as we move on from that, what can we find in this symbiosis, in this marriage between the nonprofit and the for-profit? And I think this is important. What we're going to start out looking at is employees. Now, how many people today do the work that they do only to survive, only to have sufficient money to pay their bills? How many work and view it as, I put in my eight hours of labor, and then I can go home and be a real human being and do what I want to do? and do the kind of work I would like to do at home. What their work is ultimately is only a necessary means, an evil in some sense in their life, towards the end of food, shelter, clothing, etc. And so their work is actually at its deepest base founded on fear, fear of hunger, fear of homelessness. Now most of us in this room probably enjoy what we do. I know I do and I'm blessed in that. But most of the people in the world do not in the work they do. What if you actually enjoyed the work you did? What if the work you did had purpose and meaning apart from the money it provided you? What if you could put your heart into your work because it's part of something bigger, something that helped others, something that you cared about, something that under other circumstances you might even do without remunerative response? What if you had a passion for your work and there was a purpose merely beyond survival to your efforts? And what if you could spend your time doing something good for others, something that had meaning beyond you, and that provided for your own needs, put food on your tables and on the tables of others? So what if your work every day was motivated by love, by seeking the good of others, which at the same time provided for your own human needs? How cool would that be? Customers, purchasing with a purpose, it changes the whole psychology of the consumer market. The way we purchase would begin to change. The product you need is offered with comparable pricing or even a little more by an organization, a company that you know supports something good that you like. Who are you going to buy from? Who are you going to buy from? You're going to buy from them. And what if this starts to spread throughout our countries? What happens to the whole consumer focus? What if a consumer could purchase the products they needed or wanted at the same time support good works? What if you knew that a company was focused on a particular good that meant something to you and moved your heart, and not so much on the bottom line of profit that was there. What if the people who worked for this company, the employees, and even the executives at the top, were there to serve a greater good? How would that affect your choices in purchasing? There's a transformation here as well. Remember, from the private and personal good of me as a consumer for what I want and need, to not only am I getting something I need, but 
I'm able to do something for others simply by what I purchase and who from and how I purchase. So they will begin to purchase with a purpose beyond themselves and their choices could even begin to be colored and determined by how they would seek the good of others. That's really cool. Now, we move into one other thing with the investors on this. Instead of purchasing, I mean, of starting things for greed, instead of agreed for gold, you have agreed for good. The investors who start these things are intimately involved with the organizations they're involved with. They also are seeking the good of others and providing for the good works that are needed and for themselves. So what we have here is a win-win-win situation. Customers, nonprofit organizations, investors, the whole of society starts to move in a way that has love as its primary focus of seeking the good of others. And what I'm asking today is nothing big, nothing crazy, nothing hard to do, but for people to consider, this isn't going to upset the economy of the world, but transform it into something better. Nonprofit organizations should seek to find for-profit sustainability options to help them in what they do. That's not a hard thing to start thinking about at the very least. Some of us have done it and it works. Two, that for-profit enterprises start to consider not simply supporting a particular cause now and then with their 10% check at the end of the year, but start aligning themselves as that's what they're about and that's what they're supporting and to bring that into their whole for-profit enterprise. And then thirdly, that even starting businesses, for-profit businesses, whose goal in and of itself, much like Goodwill, or another one I know in Los Angeles, that makes t-shirts and it's all gang members that are brought in to do this. It was started so that gang members could move on and have a business and learn how to do something. What would this do for the world? Now, every one of you out there is involved in some sort of nonprofit organization. Every one of you knows how hard it is to find money to support that. Here's another instrument, tool, to put in your toolbox for supporting, and one that can be a long-term sustainability and can change society at the same time. Now, 1,500 years ago, my brothers planted a seed. Its roots spread throughout the West, and today we've got the emergence of social entrepreneurism, as we call it, that has the potential to change the way the world produces, consumes, and supports one another. The emergence has happened, and with this, I wish you all the best in all you do, seeking the good of others, and in supporting your good works, with good work, emergence happens. Thank you all.